All right, so welcome, guys. So we are, we are, we have a special guest with us today. I am Sheila, the heartbeat, pump my heartbeat. And um, I'll let my, uh, my co-host introduce himself and then we'll introduce our special guest to you guys for today. Welcome to Conversations and Situations, everybody. Welcome to Conversations and Situations, another episode. Uh, yeah, I'm excited, I'm boring. Everyone calls me Gio on the show. I call myself Gio on my sh on the show. <laughs> so I'm excited for another episode. Excited for a very very special guest, and excited to spend some time tonight yeah. with the um, with the situation and conversations family. Uh, we're a great family. Yeah. So we have a special guest tonight. Our special guest, special, special guest tonight is Barrett Pitner. So Barrett Pitner is originally from Marietta, Georgia. And um, after completing his master's degree in journalism, he moved to Washington, D.C., where he currently resides. With all the books behind him, I'm loving it. He is a philosopher. He is a journalist. He and he is the founder and PIC, which is the philosopher in chief. <laughs> of the Sustainable Culture Lab. Welcome to the Conversations and Situations, Barry. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Yeah. Thanks for that great introduction. I, Absolutely. That, yeah, that, that's who I am. Uh, I can say more about myself, but I think that was fine. That was good. We yeah. appreciate we appreciate you joining us. And when looking at the topic, when I first heard about your topic, at first I thought it was going to be about one thing, but once I start to dig a little further, I thought to myself, oh no, this is the topic all on its own. And so I can't wait. I'm really excited to just learn everything that you have going on around this topic. And um, and so we just we're gonna kind of get started. Why don't we kind of start if it's okay, kind of at the beginning? How long have you been in journalism? Oh, journalism? Uh, yeah. I'd say like 10 years. Like I went to North, you know, professionally 10 years. I went to journalism school in 2009. Okay. 2010. And so since then, um, I've been in DC doing journalism in various capacities for like 10 years or so. And wow. you know, before that, before grad school, I wrote and did blogs and stuff. So I've always been interested in writing, but as a profession, about, about a decade. Okay, which is a lot of, which, you, which means that you've seen a lot. And so my next question is, considering everything that you've had you've seen and everything that you've had to cover, when was it, or can you pinpoint, when was the shift from you um, from just covering what you wanted to cover into actually creating change around our culture? Uh, well, that's a good question. So, uh, even as a journalist, I've always, um, I've always had like an opinion and that's kind of like a, that's a difficult line in journalism because basically as a journalist, your, your job is to report the information that other people share with you. You know, you talk to people, you ask them questions, they give you information and you write about that. Right. Um, I've always thought that at a certain point, like if you talk to enough people and they give you enough information, you should be able to like create information to share with other people that's based on that info you got like you can right. become an expert by talking and communicating with enough people and so i think for most of my career i've kind of like balanced that line but then in around 2015 i became like an opinion columnist where they just wanted me to write my opinion and not uh me write the opinions that other people told me they had when i interviewed them right. so about so about 2015, I started writing my opinion. And then at that point, if you're going to say what your opinion is, you need to make sure that your opinion um, does something. Because like, what's the point of saying what you think if you don't want anything to happen from it? Like, what's That's right. If you, do, if you want nothing to happen, then say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. All right, so you can kind of pinpoint a little bit. So from that whole um, experience, somebody's giving me a feedback. So from that whole experience and you deciding around that time that you wanted to, to make a shift, you created the Sustainable Culture Lab, which first of all, I love the name of your company. I love it because it's intentional, it's direct, it says exactly what it is. And um, so it's called the Sustainable Culture Lab. Will you tell our, um, everyone a little bit about your company? Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad that you love the name because my company is quite complex. Um, so it's a, it's, 
it's a cultural think tank. And so like in DC, like a think tank is an entity that like, creates policy. Uh, so like, for example, say- I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Hush, I think it may be your background. Somebody's giving me a feedback. I got to be able here. Okay, go ahead. Perfect. Yeah, better. So, uh, so like in, in, in DC, there's, there's this whole infrastructure that are think tanks. And what they do is they'll create policies and ideas and they'll give them to, you know, congressmen, influencers, people that make laws. These policies will, will help people make laws to make society better. And so this is like a, a, a general thing in DC. But my focus as a, as a columnist, as a, as a writer, as a journalist, um, I noticed that America never really did much analysis on culture. Like, what's the culture of people defining culture? Excuse me, Posh. It, it's really you. It's, it's your, you're giving me a feedback. Okay, okay. You can take it off when you have a question or something, but it's, it's giving us a feedback and we can't hardly hear them. Okay, sorry. Yeah, no worries. And so, with these, what I noticed that there wasn't really a focus on culture. And I felt that, um, you know, we just didn't focus on culture as a society. We would spend a lot of time focusing on race right. and, and, and income and the environment and all these like things that are part of culture, right. but like come off of it. It's kind of like if you're looking at a tree, we'd have all these things and they were like focusing on branches and no one's focusing on like the roots or the mm. trunk. Mm. And so I felt that there was a need for a cultural think tank. And so we do a whole bunch of stuff uh, that focus on like analyzing culture and articulating culture and using culture as a way to articulate the problems in our society. And so like a key thing, and this is where it gets complicated. So I'm glad you like the name because there's a lot of stuff going on, okay. but like your culture is, it's many things, but it's, a big thing it's the words that you say right you know, like, like the culture of someone that lives in switzerland is going to be different than the culture of someone in ethiopia right and one of the big differences between their culture is they have different languages and so like i think the u.s has a culture that i call ethnocidal i think mm -hmm. it's a very de detrimental type of culture and i think the words we use the language we we we, we have is one that actually encourages ethnocide and encourages this negative stuff to happen. So a big part of that, that, that word, ethnocide, yeah. that's exactly what I want to talk about. Yes. Hold on a second, because I, I want to talk about it. So I'll let you ask your question in just a moment. So my question before we ask that question is, is your, um, is your message to the people in the culture or people who are trying to understand the culture better? Who, who, who are you directing? Or is, or is there a direction? It's both. It's okay. both because we're all in the culture and we don't know that we are. So okay. it's kind of like, say, say, like, uh, say you're visiting, you got a friend that's visiting Atlanta and mm -hmm. they've never been to Atlanta before. If they're in the middle of a street and they don't know where the shop is around the corner, they need someone that gives them a word right. for like where they are and where they need to go but like they're still in the same place. Like, right. they're the place. like they're in the environment. And so like, I think America in many ways, people are in that environment, but there's just not a language that encourages them to know like where they are and what it's called and where to go. Right. And so, so it's like that. So it's both. I got you, got you. Okay, IQ, I think you were gonna ask about ethnocide. If you wanna, are you gonna ask about the definition? Cause first we gotta ask that. No. I'm very familiar with the I'm very familiar with the definition. So but I don't think I don't, I don't think most people are. That's what I was gonna say. Before you get into the word, let's make sure we understand what the word means. Cause I I were, I was not at first. I had to actually look it up. I knew the word side means to kill or destroy or something like that. So, but I wasn't necessarily sure. And so Barrett, will you tell us a little bit more about the word ethnocide? Yeah. So um so the the history of the word is that it was created in uh, 1944 by this Jewish immigrant to the U.S. named Raphael Lemkin. Okay. Uh, left, he left Poland to come to America so that the Nazis didn't get him. And while he was in America, he wanted to come up with a word 
he wanted to tell like the American government, the military, like what's happening to his people so that America could go and like prevent it. And Americans just didn't believe that this was happening. They just mm -hmm. didn't think like the Germans were, could do something like that. And so Lemkin said, I need to make a word. And so he made two words. The first word is genocide. Okay. And genocide, genos in, uh, in Greek means um, like uh, people. People, nation, essentially. Um, but he also made this other word, ethnocide, which okay. means culture, nation. Because if you really think about it, like a type of people become a type of people because they live in the same place. Okay. When they're living in the same place, they also create a culture. They also create like a government system or like a nation. They give that place a name. And so those okay. words like overlap. Um, and so he thought they would be interchangeable. And clearly that just didn't happen. Genocide became the word that we know, which was the destruction of people or the forced removal of people. And, you know, it's an international atrocity. It's a big deal. Right. Uh, uh, ethnocide was forgotten. And around 30 years or so, it kind of got popular or more known in English when applying to indigenous people. So, like, if you got, like, a Native American and you took them out of, like, their tribe and said, we're going to make you learn English stuff. We're going to make you become, like, you know, you know was they wanted to kill the savage and keep the man and so like we're right. going to teach you how to not be a savage by learning english <laughs> right exactly make See, that's, like a, us. <laughs> that's yeah. the thing about ethnocide ethnocide it, it it destroys their culture without physically harming the people like right. it changes the people and infiltrate those changed people back into their culture so which facilitates more change so that's how the that's how ethnocide was originally used with regards to indigenous people. The mm -hmm. distinction with my work is that like, I use the term ethnocide to describe the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. Whereas like, instead of ethnocide being something that happened to people over like a 20 year window, you know, say like they got the kids and they indoctrinated the kids and the parents stayed in the tribe and then the kids came back and you know, that ended up destroying the culture. With the transatlantic slave trade, the goal of that objectively was to crush all African culture, but keep the African people so that you could have a chattel slavery system. And like, then in the Americas, they said, we're gonna base our entire civilization around doing this forever. Mm. And like, that's just how we're gonna live. Right. And you know, our notions regarding race all derive from ethnocide. Like the race, you know, the race of white people are just like a culture of people that said, we're gonna live the oppressing this other group of people. Right. And that other group of people, we're gonna call them such and such. And we're gonna say that that is another race. So like, you can't really talk about race adequately without talking about ethnocide. Right. So your company, the Sustainable Lab, is, I mean, the Sustainable Culture Lab, tie that in with ethno ethnocide. How are you using the word ethnocide uh, through your lab and how, how can you tie it in? How are you using this yeah. word? Yeah, so because with, so the, the word sustainable, the phrase sustainable culture lab is directly connected to the desire to combat ethnocide because, okay. because ethnocide straight, straight up is clearly not sustainable. Like you can't, you can't have a, a society or any kind of relationship based on perpetually exploiting somebody else forever. You know, like if, if the people in the, on this podcast decide, want, you know, want to be friends and, and to be friends, you know, Sheila said, I'm just going to exploit Giovanni forever. That wouldn't be a friendship that would last. Like he would try to escape. Like <laughs> right. he, he would try to go away. And then, and then Sheila, and then Sheila would have to be like, ah, I'm going to go catch you. And I'm going to bring you back. And now, you know, Sheila's whole day is going to be spent like, keeping Giovanni trapped so that he can exploit him forever. That's not sustainable. That's not a fit. That's not a way that any society should try to live. Um, and so ethnocide is the most unsustainable way to live ever. There's just no sustainability to it at all. And so as a people that live in an ethnocidal society, which we do, right. if we're trying to make a better culture, we have to make a culture that at the very least can articulate how our present culture isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. And so that, 
So that's where ethnocide, how it's so interwoven with our work, where you have to let people know in a way that's really succinct and, and um, not demonizing the problems with what we live, where we live, so that we can then decide, try, create a laboratory for making sustainable culture. And at least like imagine what that looks like. Because what happens now is we live in a place that's unsustainable, but we think it is. Like we've been made. And so people try to like tweak it. They try to make a modification here, a modification there. It's like, no. It's like, falling. It's it all hurt. falling apart. It's just like putting a piece of plaster on a leaky pipe. No matter how many times you put plaster on that pipe, it's still going to leak. And at some point, it's going to fall apart. Exactly. At the very least, you need to have a conversation about maybe we could get a better pipe. Maybe we could just replace the whole pipe and make a better one. There you go. At the very least, you should be able to have the capacity to have that conversation. And right now, like America really loves to have a conversation about the, the, the benevolence of like plugging the hole. Never ever talking about, let's just get a new pipe. Right. Yeah. We nope. have a language that like, adequately allows you to do that so like our organization like put a put a mask on the whole so getting the word ethnocide out sounds like kind of a, like a movement this is this is kind of a movement do you consider it like a movement or um because when you when you think about well, it not so much the word ethnocide but combating the ethnocide yeah exactly so okay. Well, yeah, the, clearly, I, I definitely do not want to have a movement that does ethnocide. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I was thinking in terms oh, no. of teaching the people what it is so that yeah. we can, yeah, teaching people what it means so that we can do some action behind it. Yeah, 100%. Like, you know, that the, the point of the word, that using the word and, you know, like, to be honest with you, like, Lemkin coined it, but, like, I actually, like, created it and then found out he already made it. Like, mm -hmm. as a writer... I was trying to write ways to describe our, our systemic oppression. And whenever I would talk about race, people just, it, something was missing. I couldn't, they couldn't get what exactly I was trying to say. And then, you know, at some point, you know, we had one of those light bulb moments. It's like, it's not a racial question. It's a culture question. It's culture, boom, boom, boom. And so, so I definitely think that this is, uh, these are words that can be like foundational and strengthen like, the movements that are already happening. I think Black Lives Matter is clearly a, a fight against ethnocidal oppression, right. like a hundred percent. You know, the problem for, for, you know, I hate to, I don't want to talk bad about myself, but like, I'm just not a person that wants to be on social media all day. Mm -hmm. I'm not a person that loves going around and saying, oh, look at me, I'm great. Listen to me, here's my opinion, talk, 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 talk. Like, that's just not what I'm good at. And I got like too much, like, business organizational stuff to like do to like be that person so okay. luckily for me i got people that like on my team that like really care about the work and they'll say oh i found out about this podcast bear that you've never heard of i think you should be on it and i'll say cool i trust you i got <laughs> i got a time on a, on a tuesday to do this and so yeah i definitely think it's a it's a word that can empower our existing movements I think that is very important that you brought that up about the point, like just not talking at people, talking to and with people, because I think a lot of influencers and people who motivate other people and speak to other people, they tend to forget that if people don't move with you and your message, then they become lost in the sauce pretty much. And it's not fair for you to give out all this advice and you just, you just, as a speaker, you just talk and you never move, the people that move with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, 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 I totally agree. But the key thing is like for language to matter, like it should matter regardless who says it. So like if the words that I, I'm saying only have significance when I talk, then like my words are kind of trash. They just stink. And so, I agree. so the key thing about ethnocide as a, as a word is I think it, 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 the meaning of it and the understanding of how pervasive it is matters regardless of whether I'm saying it. Like clearly I hope if somebody else says it that they're redirected back to my organization because we're devoted to like this work and it will help us do this stuff. But like 
I'm not talking about ethnocide because like I need attention or I want attention or I need people to think that I'm like good or something. Like that's irrelevant. Like I don't care about that. Well, you're good anyway. We met you, so. <laughs> I love the idea. I love the fact that you actually gave the word ethnocide a voice. Like if it's been around for, you know, for a long time, but we've never heard of it, then it having a voice, I love the idea of you giving it an actual voice. And there are probably, I'm sorry, go ahead. I know you, I, I was, I've literally only heard that word once in my entire life before today. I've never heard that word my I entire never. life. And that's why, I was, that's why I was familiar with his definition. And it intrigued me when I saw it. And I was like, well, if this I have to know. It's the same thing with, like, I want to talk about the, I want to, because a lot of people don't understand the differences either between utopia and evtopia. With his, right? with he, yeah, with he, yeah, we're going to, we're going to talk about that too. Um, I do, but before, before we get into that, I wanted to ask him about, um, uh, what was I going to ask? Oh, so I know there are probably a gazillion ways because when people, when things are done behind, the, systematically, they're done behind the scene and people not, don't necessarily see it because it's done just like that. They don't want you to see it. Can you think of some ways that maybe if someone is not thinking that, well, you know, what do they actually mean? What are, what's being done to us behind, what, what's being done systematically? Yeah, like they're everywhere, it's everywhere. And yeah. so, and like this, this leads into Evtopia because once I tell people how ethnocide exists, everyone just gets real depressed. And then they're like, what's the alternative? Like, all right, well, here's another word I made, you know, here's, here's the one to make you feel better. Um, but so a, a, a real easy example is gentrification. Gentrification mm -hmm. is just, oh, wow. And this is, this is why. It, if you live in a society, it's based on sustained division. Where like you literally, you got, you know, there a one group of people, European colonizers, gave themselves the identity of being like a white race so that they could never be confused with the African people whose culture they worked to systematically destroy and brought to America, to the Americas, to oppress in perpetuity. If you make a society with division at its foundation, you're going to create a government, you're going to create structures that right. just aren't going to allocate any resources to Black people, to right. African, African people. That's just, the system is just going to be structured like that. But you also can't let those Black people live far away from you. Because if they live far away from you, you can't exploit them. Yeah, absolutely. So, so like, if you need to use Black people to come into your house to cook your food and take care of your kids, and like, you know, deliver your mail and mow your lawn. Those black people can't live far away because you don't want them to like, it, like they might not show up if they have to- Find out that they're free or something. <laughs> you know, or they, might, or they might, might just not come back. They might, they right. say, might say, we prefer to live another way. Absolutely. So you gotta like have them live next door. And so yeah. what ends up happening is the black people in the South, the South is a great example because they literally have train tracks. Like the whole phrase, the other side of the tracks are like, they made a town in the middle of the town has a dividing line, that's the railroad. And these railroads the South made to- Tallahassee, Florida? Everywhere. But, the, but just yeah. think about it, the railroads, the railroads that exist in the South were created so that they could move the goods that slaves created. And so yep. like, the dividing line of the town was, all right, this is a line that was created because this is how white people get money. Like right. all the stuff that black people created for free, enslaved, we're gonna, make a, we're gonna make the railroads. Atlanta is terminus, the big intersection of all the railroads. Yep. That's gonna be the middle of the town. And on one side, all the white people who get the money from the railroads get to live. And on the other side are the black people who don't get any stuff from the railroads, you know? And they just live there and then they cross the tracks to go work for the white people. Absolutely. Uh -huh. So just the structure of the towns is ethnocidal. Like there's no, like if you go to Europe or go to any good country that people like to visit, the middle nope. of those towns will always be like some big cultural gathering space. It's like a town square, yep. it would be like a church, something that everyone in the city just goes to all together. Yeah, there's no blatant systemic separatism. Yeah. Like outside you know. of this country. In this country, systemic separatism is blatant. It's everywhere. Macon it's is like, another place. Macon is another place that's separated by train tracks. If you go yeah. one, one side of those train tracks in Macon, it's a beautiful place. Hospitals, stores, all yeah. kind of stuff down there. Simply cross the tracks. And yeah, it's, it's a completely different place. Like that all across it's, America. It's, all, it's, like, um, like, have the term, the other side of the tracks, do all pervasive distance. 
you know, and the other okay. side is with, with bad people, you know? And right. so, so this goes to language, but just to, I'll go quick and say like how it is, how this manifests today with gentrification, okay? Because it, the train tracks aren't necessarily the divider, but the, the structure is there. There's one group of people that are in a city to be exploited and to get zero funding or protection from the government. And there's another group of people that are there to exploit and get all the stuff from the government. Yeah. Well, at some point, capitalism makes it harder for white people to live in white space. Like property rates go up. It gets too yeah. expensive. Yeah. And young, the young people can't even afford to live in the same part of town as their parents. And so they have to go look for a new place to live that's affordable. Right. This is not necessarily being malicious or evil, but it's like, huh, look at this. I cross one street and the houses look the same. It's got all the stuff and it's way, way cheaper. I'm sure I can go in there and just like pay more money and the black person who's living here will just move someplace else. Mm -hmm. And like, that just happens. They just, that's the process. And then the black people that move someplace else, they again, can't move that far away because all the wealth and job opportunities are concentrated in the white part of town. So like America has this system that's essentially just like perpetual displacement and exploitation. That's just the norm. And it's because like we're divided. We're like, you know, white people will get priced out of their space, they'll go into the exploited env environment and then they'll live there. And then the black people will move to another place and then the system will go again. Sometimes yeah. when they move the black people out of one place, those black people move into the white place. And then the white people say, I can't live here anymore. And then they move someplace else. And so that's one, that one sounds of, like East Lake, don't it? Yeah, one of the, East Lake is a prime example, but uh, one of the things that I've been following, because I follow a lot of news in Atlanta and the majority of us are in Atlanta and um, Barrett, you used to live in Atlanta. Um, yeah. One of the things that I was really proud of DeKalb County was this was a couple of months ago prior to coronavirus um they actually banned the uh banned new permits for um creation of dollar stores because in the news articles um the dollar stores was actually creating food deserts in um, low-income neighborhoods yeah. and that goes back to gentrification. If you go to an all black neighborhood, you don't see any fresh food source. You don't see any fruits and vegetables anywhere. Everything is a dollar store or a liquor store or a hair store. And it's not, it's not bad, but also we deserve great things in our neighborhood. We shouldn't have to travel to in the city or we should have to travel to Alpharetta or somewhere else to get just all, basic it's nice it's quality. It's all foundational to ethnocide. Like they, they, society can intentionally created it in a part of their community that they, on purpose, want to deprive of services. And so, due to that, say you're a business, whether you are a business that's racist or not, you're looking for a place to get money and make money. You are going to be disincentivized to move into an area that is intentionally being deprived of services. It's Those true. people will not have the revenue to make you a lot of money. Yep, yep. We'll go into the area where people have way more money than they know what to do with mm -hmm. because they're just getting like all sorts of money from these exploitative structures that in many cases, like they don't know are exploitative. They just know that's always been the norm because we've always been ethnocidal. And so like when you talk about it, it not only does it make like black people acutely aware of like, ah, I can actually use this one word to describe all these systemic oppressions that happen. And then white people can say, I can use the same word to describe all of these uh, systemic oppressive structures that like I'm a part of, but I didn't necessarily make, I've, I've contributed to without necessarily knowing that I was doing it because it wasn't a word to tell you, like if you're doing something bad, but the word bad doesn't exist, you're going to keep on doing bad stuff. Right. You know? And so let me ask you yeah. this. What about, what about, do you think that the leaders of counties, cities, states, 
their education on ethnocide, do you think that them being educated first and then it trickles down or do does does it even matter where it starts? It doesn't matter where so it starts. Awareness and education, I mean. Yeah, it doesn't matter where it starts. Like, we're, we're talking about Georgia. Like, right. Georgia's not going to do a good job in any way of educating people about race or racism. And like, I'm from Georgia. And like, and, and it's, it's, for some people, it could be that they're just like sinister and they, they want to like spew like lost cause pro-Confederate propaganda. It totally could be that. But right. there's, Plenty of Georgians who genuinely just, you know, the white ones that genuinely just don't want to believe that like their great grandparents were like really bad people. Right. Like that, like that's an emotional bridge that they just don't want to cross. And, right. and I totally get not wanting to cross that, but that's going to impair your capacity to educate people. Mm -hmm. and so, so like, no, I don't think the systemic structure of Georgia is equipped at all at like teaching people this type of stuff. Yeah. I think, I think- They don't wanna face it at all. I, I think- and See, that's, that's the thing, it, it's true. They don't, there are a lot of them that will not cross. They will treat that bridge like it's not there. Like that, like your grandfather didn't own 36 slaves. Nobody, it, it doesn't matter if you refuse to not cross that bridge, doesn't mean that bridge is not there. Bridge is still there. Your yeah. grandparents were still bad people whether you wanna recognize, acknowledge it or not. Yeah, like, and the, the thing that's that's funny, and it's not funny, but like, it's funny because it's absurd, is you'll get the response of that from like poor white people that like their ancestors were too poor to own slaves, therefore like they weren't racist. And it's like, just so you know, everybody that lived in the South was racist. Like if you got a time machine and picked up any white person from the South, even like the most progressive white person you could imagine, from like the 1850s and put them in America today, they'd be a horrible, horrible person. Like nobody would want to associate with them ever. Like period. And that's all of them. And so the, what ends up happening is people use that as like, that was just how society norm. You can't judge them because of that. It's like, actually, I'm gonna judge all of them. They're all bad. And like so many other countries, have actually done this progression where they've acknowledged that like the way of life at one time was acceptable and it isn't and we just stopped it. Like mm. that's just not a thing. Like the French Revolution that we are so inspired by, that was created by acknowledging at scale that the way of French life at that time was just no longer socially acceptable and we had to stop it like flat out. It right. wasn't like, and, and they're like, not only do we have to stop it, we don't even know what we'll replace it with. We haven't figured out what comes next, but we do know that that right there, that can't happen anymore. That's a problem. <laughs> it needs to stop. There was no pumping the brakes at all. They slammed like, the brakes on it and stopped. Like, like, no joke, Period. people thought that the King of France was like God's representation on earth. And they were like, well, don't matter. Like we gotta kill you. And a lot of French people killed themselves after yep. the king was, was murdered because they didn't know how to live without like- Without his word. Mm -hmm. God on earth. Like that's how, that's how profound like the, 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 the change was. Americans just won't even want to act like you could imagine doing something that the rest of the world did like 200 plus years ago. Like it's outrageous. <laughs> It is crazy. Okay, now, Quinn, I think we can talk about IQ. I think you wanted to get into asking about, um, and we can let our guests tell us a little bit more about, um, I, I read um, in, in, in doing some discovery about you that you talked about um, in your sustainable culture lab, and I keep saying the words because I want people to understand. I want people to hear your company's name. I want them to understand that you are associated with the word um, um, Yep. Well, that you uh, well tell us a little bit about Eftopi. There you go. I was about to spit it out. Come on. <laughs> cool. I'll talk about Eftopia. I'll give a quick plug to my organization. Like you said, it's the Sustainable Culture Lab. The website is scl.community, and we have a newsletter that you can subscribe to called The Word, and we send you a new word every week to mm -hmm. like enlighten you, and it shows up in your inbox every Sunday at eleven o'clock. So, you know, AM or PM? 
a.m. Okay. A.m. <laughs> yeah, like, we ain't, we ain't trying to get people right before they, like, go to bed on a Monday, like, before Monday, before work. <laughs> right. Because <laughs> once Sunday night rolls around, you're in the mood for Monday. And now that, that would be one of the worst times to send a newsletter. 11 p.m. on a Sunday. <laughs> I'm, right. Speak for yourself. I'm never in a mood for Monday. Monday sucks. I don't like Mondays. I've always told people if you can get through Mondays, you can get through any days of the week. Mondays are the hardest days to get so the through. The goal is that you get it on Sunday and that, that, that enlightenment, that information can like boost you for Monday. Mm. I like that. Yeah. I like that. For the week. All right. So, Eftopia. Eftopia. Yes. So, Eftopia means sustainable good place. All right. Okay. We made the word. Like, actually, some other people, like, the word exists because it's really easy to, like, create, but we, like, changed the definition. Kind of like the same thing with ethnocide. We're, like, we use the definition, but we applied it in a way that, like, no one's done it before. Mm -hmm. So here's a story about Evtopia. The word utopia that everyone knows about, like, you know, a utopian play, something that's good, that word's a total joke. It, it, it doesn't mean what we think it means. And this is how that word was created. Uh -huh. In 1516, this British guy named Thomas More made this book called Utopia. And that's how the, that's how the word exists in the world. He has made this, this satirical book. And he, in the book, he invented the word utopia. Mm -hmm. This is how the word utopia is structured. So the, in Greek, the word topia or topos means place. Okay. Now, Uh-oh. Barrett, I think you're frozen. Barrett, Barrett. It's non-existent. Barrett. Did I break up? Yeah, uh -oh. yes, you did. Uh-oh. Okay, I can, when you're back, can you go Okay, I can repeat that. Please. Yeah, I'll repeat it. Am I back? Am I good? Or am yes, I frozen you're now? You're good. Okay, so I, maybe somebody in my house got on the internet or something. Um, but, so here's the deal. Topia in Greek means place. The Greek prefix EU means good. The Greek prefix OU means non-existent. So what Thomas More did is he just cut off the E and the O and put the U on topia to make a new word that means non-existent good place. Okay. And so ever since he made that word, people have been using that word as, as if it means good place or good place that exists. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, like, it definitionally means non-existing good place. And so for like 500 years, Europeans have literally, without really thinking about it, been trying to make non-existent good places. And tragically, I think they've been very successful. And so, <laughs> and so if we're trying to create a culture where people can make good places, at the very least, we have to have a word that means good place and not tell people that the word that means non-existent good place means it's good place. place. I seem to tell you. That's like telling people that up means down, you know? <laughs> right. Like, it doesn't make any sense. But you, right, but you know the masses, the quote-unquote sheeple, they'll never dig that deep. Like, they'll take that word utopia because they heard it on, they heard yeah. it on TV or they use it on Facebook, and they'll take it and run with it because yeah. they heard it on the internet. Yeah, totally. But that's, that's just people. Like, I don't, I don't really expect people to, you know, do everything that I do. And I don't think anybody should expect everyone to do what they do. Like, and this is going to sound, this might sound arrogant or something. It's not intended to be. But, you know, like when I was in school, like, I would make good grades. That was like a thing that happened. Not everyone made good grades. Mm -hmm. does, right. that, does that mean that those people, like, are bad people? No, it just nope. means this particular thing, I'm, I was better than them at it. No big deal. But there'd be plenty of times where like, someone said, hey, Barrett, there's a person that needs like tutoring in math. Do you think you could help them with math? And I said, yeah, of course I can help them with math. I'll tutor them. If I looked at that fact that this person needs tutoring, and I said, this means that this person's like a bad person, or they're an mm -hmm. idiot. Right. What's wrong with them? There may be something wrong with me. And so like, I don't really expect people to necessarily do the work that I do or to be 
good at the things that I happen to just like randomly be good at. Like I didn't make my brain. Like it just happened to be in my head since I've been born. <laughs> 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 it, came it came that way. It just happened. So like the fact that like, I'm smarter than somebody else, I didn't do anything to do that. Like all nope. I did was like not do like an abundance of drugs and stuff to like ruin my brain, but like it's just there. So I don't have anything to do with it. So I'm not gonna like judge people. That. Eric, so, since you've been doing your work with you uh, with um, Eftopia and, and everything, have you had any pushback? Have you had anyone to push back for well, um, more so with ethnicity? There's always pushback. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, no. There's definitely always pushback, but like it's it's the nature of the pushback. Mm -hmm. You know, like there, yeah. one one thing that's fascinating is like the ideas that people have. They, for by and large, have like a strong emotional attachment to it. Like, mm -hmm. people really, really like to think that uh, their ideas are correct. And they're also really scared that if someone tells them or proves to them that their ideas are, like, not as correct as they think, that we'll, like, we'll make fun of them. Or we'll, like, we'll tease them or make them feel bad. Right. And so right. Like, I don't really have any agenda of, like, making someone feel bad because they didn't have the exact same idea that I had. Mm -hmm. Like, that don't make any sense. And so, like, the key thing is... If someone had gives this pushback, I don't push back to them in a way that's like intended to make them feel bad. Like right. it's not a personal attack. And so, like, so yeah, there's definitely always pushback. People are quite inquisitive because you know we have a whole language that, and and also be honest, like what I talk about and what I focus on are really things that people don't want to believe are real. Right. Like, no one really wants to believe that the place that they live is as bad as I'm saying it is. Right. And I really don't like to believe that it's, a, that it's so easy for me to say and like articulate that it's as bad as it is. That like I'm, like America. And they don't want America. to people doing things, yeah, systematically behind, you know, behind the scenes. America. <laughs> but, but like the pushback happens, like it, the pushback, is, it's really unpredictable. Like, it's not like I get pushed back from white people and I get pushed back from black people. No, I get pushed back all across the board because it really depends on how emotionally attached you are to your own ideas or the, an idea that you think is real. Like, that's really it. And so, yeah, the, but the key thing is, like, I don't try to, like, you know, point and laugh at somebody if like I have a, a discussion that makes their opinion, you know, not not as solid as they thought it was. Um, right. That's like this is one of the reasons why like I'm not that active on Twitter. Like Twitter's not a good place. To, like stay. No, Twitter is horrible. <laughs> like like you can't. It's like America doesn't really have that many good platforms to state your opinion without saying somebody else's opinion is bad. Right. Like, right. And some people don't know how to handle right. finding out that their opinion sucks ass. Right, and it's like not it's not necessarily that like it thinks, but like you know, say all of us go and are taking a in school together and we take classes and like, you know, like Giovanni gets a hundred, I get an eighty-five, you know, you guys get like, you know, grades that are in the middle. Neither one of us got Fs. Like neither one of us are like total morons. You right. Know? We're functional people, but like if I'm gonna need some help, I'd go talk to Giovanni. He got a hundred, it makes sense. But like, we don't like encourage that type of conversation. Like if he got a hundred and I didn't get a hundred, the conversation America likes to have is that I got a zero, that I'm an F student and I won't be good at anything ever, ever. And we got to fight it out. And- Why did I get a hundred? Because I look like I'm at taking first day of school. <laughs> No, no, that that no, I just said you got a hundred because like my finger was like, the closest to your face on the screen. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You were randomly the smart one. Totally random, and that's how random it is. Like like I said, like I didn't put my brain in my head. Totally random, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so like, yeah, there's definitely pushback. The key thing is just like don't try to ridicule people when you get pushback. Right. And that's what I was going to ask. How do you combat the push? About, um, how do you combat the pushback? But I would assume just continue to to do the work. And just as um, things happened in the past with Martin Luther King and they were fighting and doing their things, eventually people catch on and they they either join the fight or they don't join. <laughs> or they don't join. Absolutely. Yeah.
what is your hope for um, for your cause or for your movement? If you if you what is your hope for? Well, there's a lot of stuff to hope. Like I, I don't like having like one particular end goal. I, I, I'm not. I don't think like that. But like at the at the at the baseline, like having the language that I cultivate be words that people use because like this isn't something that's about me that like I need to be like the best or something. It's like I think these I think these are words and there's a I have a whole bunch of other words that I think can make people's lives better. Mm -hmm. Simple. And so like if people use the words and it helps make their lives better, then like that's the hope. Like what what exactly does better look like? I'm not sure. And I can't really I shouldn't be the person that tells people what better looks like for them at an individual level. And mm -hmm. like you know, at a macro level. But what about as a culture, though? What about what it looks like as a culture? What as, you oh, so like, so here's the key thing. Like, the, the, all right, so this is the process, and this is like another word. Okay. Like, we live in a place that encourages the destruction of culture. Mm -hmm. that's, just, that's just all it is. So what you have to do is start creating structures that create culture not structures that just allow you to survive within a destructive culture, but mm -hmm. stuff that gets you to like change the dynamic. Now, what that culture that we create, the, that, I'm, I can't determine exactly what that'll look like. Yeah. But like, I do know that the culture that we have right now is one based around justifying perpetual division. So like one thing, like a project that we're working on at SCL, you know, that's why, that's why I call it the Sustainable Culture Lab for sure, SCL. And so, so like one of the things we're working on at SCL is um, the Altars Project. It's now gonna be a festival. And so like, are you guys familiar with like the, the Mexican tradition of Day of the Dead? So, so Day of the Dead is, it's, it's fantastic. And a lot of indigenous people around the world do similar rituals. It just so happens that like Mexico is right next door. There's a lot of Mexican people in the US and for like this iteration, of this fairly universal ritual is really big in the U.S. because of Mexican people. So Day of the Dead is October 31st, November 2nd. Okay. And what they do, they will make altars to remember all of their loved ones and people that they care about who have passed away. Mm -hmm. so, I can hear what you say. They will make what? Altars. Oh, altars. Okay. Oh, okay. And so like, you, you'll go into a Mexican house during the month of October and there'll be an altar erected at some point, and it'll have photos. Yeah, the photographs and knickknacks, stuff yeah. that belong to old passed away family members. Yeah. Oh they'll, yes. And they'll have a they'll, they'll have like a party or a dinner, and they'll invite uh -huh. people over, and people come over, and those and the people that come over are encouraged to add stuff to the altar, and then you have like this really profound conversation that you talk about because like <laughs> you don't normally talk about people that passed away. Like, that's just, like, not a thing that happens in, like, casual conversation. Right. Like, right. At this moment, though, you do. You get to talk about, like, your grandfather or your uncle or a friend of yours that passed away that you never really get an opportunity to talk about. You get to do it, like, with your community. And so, like, people will cry, and as they cry, they get, like, communal support. And it's really therapeutic, communal, communally strengthening idea that you get to do every single year. Mm -hmm. Every year. And so as an African-American, I first participated in Day of the Dead and it just like blew my mind. I was like, this is something that the black community definitely needs. Like we have all these conversations about like generation and like we talk about generational trauma and that we need to be aware of it, but we don't really have like cultural structures right. that allow us to combat it. We just know that it's there. Like right. if you create an annual thing in your house where you collectively get to deal with generational trauma and the and loss, that would be really healthy for the black community. And that'll be something where you're actually creating culture and not creating structures that help you to survive within perpetual cultural destruction. Mm. So, so like we have this project called the Alters Project, Alters Festival. I encourage people to do it. You know, we'll be doing a, a decent amount of stuff in like the months to come about it that like just make an altar. Like it's a very simple thing to do. You don't have to make an altar that looks like a Mexican person because like it doesn't make any sense to say, hey, black people or Asian people or white people, I think you just spend three days talking about your ancestors and while you do it, 
pretend your house is Mexican. You know, like, <laughs> just, like that just doesn't make any sense. Just yeah. like pretend, pretend to be part of another culture and then go talk about your family. That's mm -hmm. absurd. So yeah. you can make an altar that looks like how you would like an altar to look. You know, I like that actually. Make a black one. Make up your and so like this is like this is stuff that we do to create culture. Mm -hmm. Now, clearly, like when you talk about pushback, I get pushback for this idea all the time because people, since we live in an ethnocidal place that's based on taking the culture of other people and making yeah. money off of it, people mm -hmm. think that I'm advocating that we take Mexican culture, and make it a black thing, and that black people can get a bunch of money off of Mexican culture. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, that's not the goal. Like, I want Mexican people to do Day of the Dead all day long. I want that to, be, to continue to be a thing that's vibrant in the Latino community, the Mexican community forever. You know, the indigenous people have been doing that for thousands of years. Do right. it. But like, there are neighbors, and there are African traditions that are similar to this too, that were stripped away from black people because of ethnocide. Mm. So we need to do this too. Mm. We need to do the culturally affirming things that let us strengthen our culture, instead of just creating things that help us to survive while our culture is like repeatedly destroyed. And yeah. so, so like that's the, you know, so that's, you know, the hope, one of the hopes, I guess, yeah. to answer the question is that this Alters Project, Alters Festival becomes like a thing that actually happens, like, and grows and right. helps people. Because to add another layer to it, like, it happens October 31st to November 2nd, mm -hmm. every year. America's national elections are the first Tuesday of November every two years. So like this year, the national election is on November 3rd. So what, we're gonna, what we would end up having, and like, you know, and this is tragic, but it's, it's, not, it's tragic and there's, it's a coincidence, but like when John Lewis passed away, I wrote his obituary for the yeah. BBC. Wow. And, and I was talking to people about, you know what? Like when Day of the Dead comes around, I'll have a photo of John Lewis on my altar. Like that'd be crazy not to do that. Right. Like, I'm from Atlanta. I like it's like it would just be so absurd to not have a photo of John Lewis on my altar this year. He's not a family member like by blood, but like he's a cultural family member. Of course I will. If I have he is a, a very great person. Yeah, just incredible human being. If I have a photo of John Lewis on my altar that's I'm looking at every day. It would probably make sense that the day after Day of the Dead, I would make sure I vote, or I would vote during early voting. Like, I genuinely think like this Day of the Dead has the possibility of like boosting Black voter turnout to a significant degree. Like if you've got Black people for a month making altars, talking about what's important to them, doing things to strengthen their community, deal with, with, with systemic trauma and loss, and then they say this is also combined with voting and like you now have the opportunity to like vote on behalf of your culture that you've been spending time and now like you know if you if you have a if you have an anniversary a day of the dead type thing at your house like the grandparents are going to invite their kids mm -hmm. and then they're going to invite and then the, and then the kids are going to bring their kids and now you're going to start having conversations about like what life in america was like for your grandparents in the 1950s and then and it really becomes black history. Black history, black history. history. But like we, it's something you need to have. And that'll probably influence how people vote. Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, so one hope is this Day of the Dead project. That's a, that's a clear one. And I think that's one of the things that creates culture. And for that term, we use, uh, we actually use two words. We use the word ethnogenesis, which means the birth of culture. Genesis is birth. Hmm. Uh, but we also use another term called cultural naissance. So it's like the word renaissance, but we took okay. the RE because renaissance, the RE means re. So renaissance yeah. means re rebirth. But like America is an ethnocidal place. We shouldn't be trying to rebirth American stuff. Like we should be trying to birth new stuff. Yeah, that's we don't want to rebirth. Right. That's and for sure. So by saying cultural naissance, I think it provides like a linguistic reminder to people that we're not rebirthing anything. We're birthing something new. And now I need to allocate time to think about like, what does something new look like? You know, it kind of goes back to the, the point at the beginning. Let's imagine like just getting a new pipe. What would a new pipe look like? 
what would I like this new pipe to be made of instead of just thinking about let's uh, plug these holes all over all the time, you know? Yeah. And so yeah, that's the hope. I would actually <clears throat> be interested to even know what other cultural or traditions that we were that were lost during um you know during slavery and during the time when we were brought over from um africa like what are some things that you know that that probably that is a, the, yeah i would have i would love that to. is a massive massive list it's like it's 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 a it's a list so big that your brain can, it's a massive yeah. massive yeah, list. So. You know, but one I, there's a, a, a cool book that i would recommend reading it's a short one which is fun it's called prince among slaves all right, and it's a story, and it, it, it's it, there's a crazy story about how but the story is about an African prince who was kidnapped and sold into slavery and taken to America. But during his time in America, due to various things occurring, he was able to gain his freedom and go back to Africa. And so the book. Wow his story like the crazy thing and so you know i'm not i don't want to spoil this book but like when he went back to africa he went to liberia and liberia was a was a, a colony like when america didn't want black people here anymore they're like we're gonna go colonize africa and we'll just give an area in africa for like you know enslaved people to go live they want to go live there because we don't want them in america because like once they stop being enslaved they're just a nuisance so um <clears throat> and so Liberia was this place that was created by uh, formerly enslaved black people in Africa. So like if you bump into Liberians, they'll have names that are like Bill Jefferson, you know, Mike Williamson. That's not an African name, you know. Uh, and so anyways, this guy went back to Liberia. And so I learned about the story. When I was at Northwestern, I bumped into one of his ancestors who was from Liberia. And this Liberia guy did all this research and found this book because somebody else had heard about his, his ancestor's story because it was all published in the paper and stuff. And he went back to Mississippi and found the ancestors because when the guy went back to Africa, he didn't have enough money to take his whole family. So half of his kids stayed in America and half of them went to Liberia. And so he has a whole group of like Mississippi relatives that didn't even know that this was real. Wow. Like, it's crazy. And the thing that's funny is when the, not funny, it's all tragic. But when the prince was captured and he got to America, he was talking to all these white people. He's like, you guys don't understand. I'm a prince. Like, I'm really, really rich. Um, I know you got your farming and slavery stuff over here. But, like, if you want money, just send a note back to Africa on a boat. Tell my dad that I'm here. And he'll send a boat filled with more gold than you can imagine. And we good. And all these white people thought it was like a, a stupid joke. They're like, there's no way there's rich people in Africa. Gold, get out of here. And so the, the English name that they gave him was Prince. They just called him Prince as like a joke. Ah, he's a prince. Ah, look at that prince in the field, you know, like picking the cotton. Look at that prince. And so this guy then named his, one of his sons Prince. And so the name Prince like came, descended through the generations. And to this day, there are Mississippians in this family line whose first name are Prince, and they didn't know that they were Prince because their ancestor was actually an African Prince. Mm, like, that's interesting. Talk I, re I just, remember that. There's also a movie about this book. Totally, yeah. There's yeah. a movie about this book, because I've seen the movie. Do you know who's the author? Uh, hmm. Nope, not right offhand, I don't. I got it, I got it over here somewhere. Okay. It's, it's on right. the show. If you get a chance, shoot it to me. I'm gonna I'm gonna look up the book. It's just called Prince Among Slaves. Okay. That's it. It's it, the book was written by a white guy. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That I, that I did not know. Yeah, the That's white guy, like it, it's uh, a white guy just read about it and was just fascinated, and he went all through the archives and the National Archives and got just like an abundance of stuff and produced the book, and then that book didn't get much press. My, my Liberian friend, in the course of doing the, his own research about his ancestry, came upon the book. And then that book added to the research, and then they made the movie. Mm. Yep. Uh, yeah. So Terry, yeah. Terry Alford. The author's name is Terry Alford. Terry Alford, yep. 
Prince Among Slaves. So, so yeah, no, I, there's a lot of, there, there, are, there are so many things that you could, we would need to learn. Um, yeah. And there's also like an infinite amount of stuff that we won't be able to learn because it just got burnt to the ground or thrown to the bottom of the ocean. What could we do today? What could people do today to prepare to take, um, to put your to uh, put your word out there to continue to use in the word ethnocide to push the message to push the movement forward? Um, what What do you suggest? What can we do today to help out in this um, in your movement? Yeah, at a very basic level, you can just start using the language and see how you like it. Start start. You know, and by using the language and saying it out loud, but also like when you see stuff, go like, oh yeah, that's ethnocidal. You can also start thinking about like, what would an utopian place mean? Like, what would a good place look like? What, like, and that, as a person, say I'm trying to make myself into a good place. What does that entail? Like, you know, you can start asking yourself these questions first and foremost, like use the language to, you know, better yeah. your life. That's, that's the first thing, you know, Second thing, if you like our work, you know, try to support us in a way that, that's, that works for you. You know, you can go to our website, scl.community. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's totally free. You'll get it sent to your inbox. You'll get a new word every, every month. Every, sorry, not every month. Every Sunday at 11 a.m. I, I, signed, I signed up like 20 minutes ago. Boom. And then on top of that, you know, we also have like a Patreon page. And there's various ways that you could like support us financially if that's something that you're interested in. And so, you know, every little bit counts. Like I'll say, like we are a very young organization and we are definitely looking for, for funding and financial support and all that stuff that we need because okay. this is a weird thing to say, but prior to like America getting like progressively worse, a lot of people weren't that receptive to my ideas. Like, you know, I guess I'd say like, I was saying that the house was on fire and no one really wanted to believe that the house was on fire. But then if like over the course of like Ahmaud Arbery, the, the white woman in New York City that called the cops on the black guy. Yes. Floyd, yes. Once that, once the, the sequence of those three events happened, people were like, I, saw, I think stuff's on fire. There's this guy that I've been saying is crazy. Um, I think he might be onto something. Right. <laughs> And so <laughs> he's been so, screaming fire the whole time. Yeah, uh, really cause a fire. Yeah, and so right. like the lifespan of our organization being something that people want to have on a podcast and that think I make sense has really started being like from George Floyd to today. And so we definitely need uh, support and networks and connections, introductions, all that stuff that like new young businesses need to grow. Like we need all that stuff. Yeah. All right, so is there anything that you want to mention that we did not ask? Anything that you want to share? How, how can oh, people follow you on social media? Oh, yeah, that's a good thing. See, so there's all of our stuff. It's a sustainable culture lab. So our, our, our URLs are, are, are SCL underscore community or SCL dot community. Um, we also S have... Go ahead. SCL community. Or like the line community like rl is seo dot community because we didn't want to have dot com because like it's, well yeah it looks like it you see my face is on it so there's a there's a yep that's me all right seo underscore community that's on instagram we have linkedin facebook oh man my internet's unstable right now uh but no it's seo underscore community or dot community we have linkedin facebook twitter uh, Instagram. We also have a podcast platform that's okay. SEO Radio. You can, nice. find, you can find that on Spotify, Apple Music, all the stuff. Uh, like the only thing that I, that I would add, you know, I think we covered a lot. There's tons of stuff I could talk about. You know, I do a lot of this work, but I, if I answered all your questions, that's all I really need to add. And I've told you guys how to find more out, find more stuff. So yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think it was, I, I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot and I love uh, new things. And for those people who may not be able to get out on the front line, like for me, I would have loved to done um, to, to walk with the Black Lives Matter, but um, I, um, I, I'm high risk. 
So I did not get out, but doing some other things like this, spreading the word, giving to the cause, you know, just doing some other things. I, I want to be involved. So if you're able to get involved, if you're not, even if you are able to get involved on the front line and going to the Black Lives Matter and doing some other things, this is just another way that we could, um, we can get the message out that we can fight and, and fight for our culture and, and everything else. So, so actually, the thing I'd like to add is, is addition, adding on to what you just said. Mm -hmm. I think a big thing about like, the black community, right? Not right now, but like historically, is that we we have a narrative that you create change yeah. by activism, by actions. Mm -hmm. But like, what really creates change is the philosophy and the language that precedes that action. Okay. Like like yeah. Martin Luther King, his actions made sense because he had a philosophy that he called nonviolence that he learned about by researching Gandhi in India and, and modifying Gandhi's practice to be the British colonial forces and applying it to the US. So like, I think we need to realize that there's so many, like so many African-Americans right now want You went out again, I think the narrative for far too long is that the only way to do it. How about now? Am okay, I we hear you. you're back. Okay, perfect. I think for far too long, the narrative for how to make change as an African American in this society is by activism. And mm -hmm. there's plenty of people that can't be like that activist that's in the street all the time, whether right. it's health issues, whether due to like financial situations, due to various things, that's just not something that's at their disposal. But cultivating the right language, right. having the right philosophy that you can articulate what you believe in, what you what you would like to be able to do, why you're like why you can't do that iteration of activism and that your activism is maybe making an altar in your house. Or right. your activism is maybe talking about ethnocide or or, or envisioning or talking about what Eftopia is. We have to like really be clear that what makes the change is the philosophy that precedes the action. And not everyone is gonna be able to engage in the action. Like, you know, one thing that I think about quite a bit is like my parents grew up during the civil rights era, but they were like middle schoolers, you know? Right. Middle schoolers, well, yeah. middle schoolers weren't able to walk on the Evan Pettus Bridge like John Lewis. Like, if my parents were on that bridge like John Lewis and got hit in the head, they just would have died. Like, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that like, my parents as black people don't care about civil rights or don't, or don't have like a good philosophy on how to make it better. They just literally couldn't engage in that iteration of activism right like right now everyone there and do it not all of us are going to be able to so we need to make sure that there's a language mm -hmm. a philosophy that makes sure that everyone feels that they're part of this process even though they can't exercise it in one specific way right so, i agree with that definitely so agree with that. I, part of the goal of the alters project is we view that as like an activism that like everybody can do like you can do that in your house Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have to go anywhere. You can make that, you can cultivate that, and you can do that every single year really easily. I'm definitely going to look into that. I will look into that this week, and I will give you an update on how we are doing. I'm going to kind of... Yeah, you got my email. You can. Yeah. You know me. Yes, that's right. We're cool now. I will push it out to you. I'll let you know. And I'll keep pushing the word out and trying to use the word. I'm, I'm going to figure out how, the, how I can... Um, when we have our shows and how can I continue to use the word we're pushing it yeah. we have so. an email you know. All right. and we should have him back honestly yeah. yeah 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 we'll do that too well thank you so much for joining us again I yeah. really learned a lot I appreciated the conversation and um, that is all I have I just wanted to uh, thank you again for, for joining us and enlighten us yeah no thanks for having me I had a great time all thank right. you so much